You've probably seen this happen. Your team's really excited to build an AI product. Everybody's ready to go. And six months later, the project's dead in the water and nobody wants to take responsibility. Why does this keep happening? You know, MIT actually came out with a study recently that says that 95% of AI projects fail. Over the last 10 years, we've built hundreds of products across dozens of verticals and have identified the main reasons why AI projects fail. In this video, I'll show you these reasons so that yours does not. Awesome, so let's get started. The first thing that kills projects is lack of alignment and accountability. We've seen it tons of different times. We go into a room, it's full of different stakeholders. Each one has a different goal. Nobody's in alignment and nobody knows what we want to do. You know, what do we want to build? What do we want to solve? The first thing that we do when we notice that is identify, okay, who's going to be the owner here? Who's going to drive value? Who's going to be accountable? This accountability is one of the most important things. You know, we are accountable for the work that we do. We have pride in it. We love it. At the same time, the project owner needs to have that same fire, that same accountability to say, hey, I own this. My work performance depends on this. I love this. I own it. If you don't have that, there's no responsibility. If everybody owns something, then nobody does. So don't lead by committee, lead by example. At the same time, you know, you have somebody that's accountable for it. That person needs internal buy-in, right? Nobody's going to own a project in which the CEO or the CFO or the board does not approve. See, you need to make it clear. And when somebody is accountable, the board, the CFO, whoever it is, is behind them. A person will not take accountability of a project unless there's actual support behind them. So that's it. That's reason number one, lack of accountability. Before we get started, I'm Francisco. I'm the head of project strategy here at A Studio. I got my PhD in machine learning from Princeton. Then I went into the startup world. And now I work with hundreds of C-level executives and founders to make sure that their tech projects are successful. So let's get started. The second thing that we look for that's a very high indicator of failure in AI projects is that it's driven by hype rather than by a real problem. You're going to hear me say this across all my videos, but there's a reason for that. Not driving value is the main problem in any project, regardless of it's AI, if it's software, if it's accounting, finance, healthcare, whatever. If it's not driving value, it's not good. If it's all hype, it's not good. You have no idea how many times people have come to us saying, hey, I want AI, I want AI. I need it. Then we come in, ask, hey, what do you need to solve? No, I just want AI. Those projects never, never, never work. And we stay away from them. You know, it's always about strategy first and tech second. You know, people come in, say, hey, I want a chatbot. Well, why do you want a chatbot? Oh, because it's cool. It's not going to work. Hey, I want predictive analytics. Why? Because investors like that. It's not going to work. The projects that succeed are the ones where we go in, talk to the stakeholders and then say, hey, I have this pain point. I need to solve it. You know, and many, many times these problems can be solved by process changes, simple software, third party software, you know, really, really focus on where the value is and what the problem is. In other words, don't let AI be your strategy. And little aside, I actually have a video on how to find high ROI use cases for AI. So check it out. All right. Third thing, having the wrong team. Again, you've heard me say this before, but having the right team and the right people in the right positions is very, very important. See, right now, everybody's an expert in AI. Everybody has used ChatGPT, right? And that, hey, that's great. Use it. But there's a difference between knowing LLMs and actually having work in production grade systems. So identify what actual skill sets do you need? Talk to your tech team, talk to your advisors, talk to us and figure out what team do I actually need to make this happen? Because having the wrong team means your project's going to fail, right? And there's nothing wrong with learning on the job. That's great. You may want to upskill your team, but don't leave high leverage, high ROI, high strategic initiatives to a team that doesn't know how to do things. So, you know, assess, do you have the right team? Are you solving the right problem? And you have internal alignment to solve it. Those are the three things we've done so far. Okay, number four. This is actually one of my favorite ones to talk about because it's something we see every time we take a project from somebody else, right? We see an obsession with IP, an obsession with over-engineering a project. What does that mean? When we work with people that want to create a new project from scratch, they're always thinking about all the edge cases, about all the different problems that they can solve with this one thing before going on and building a whole MVP that's enterprise ready, has multiple integrations, scales perfectly. Before you do any of that, think about what's the one important thing that this thing needs to solve. If it's, you know, simple writing emails, make sure that it's awesome 
and writing emails. And then after it's great at writing emails, do all the integrations into HubSpot, Salesforce, whatever. But make sure that the core function is great. So why keep it small, right? It seems intuitive. Hey, I want to do this small, prove the thing first. But really, it's about time and money, right? This is what the board cares about. This is what your investors cares about. How fast can you make this happen? And then how much are you going to spend on it? If you blow through your timeline and you blow through your budget by building things that are not necessary, it's not going to work, right? So focus on the most important part. The other thing I wanted to include here in this same bullet point is obsession with IP. The reason why I included it here is because people put IP before solving the problem. And then we blow again through timeline and budget, making sure that we build something new instead of something useful, right? If you're solving something useful, you're going to have something valuable. If you have IP that's not solving something, right? It's not worth anything. So don't focus on the rotten things. The most valuable thing is something that solves a problem. We've gone through four different points already, and you see the red thread going through all these which is solve the right pain, solve the right problem. I know there's a lot of things here, but that's really it. So many people ask me, hey, Francisco, how do I know what to build, right? Give me some ideas on how AI can help me solve these pain points, right? And we've actually built a really cool tool called the AI Ideas Generator. What it does is you go in, you put in your pain points, what you do, and then it spits out ideas on how you can use AI or technology to solve these pain points. It's free. Come check it out. It's in the description below. So let's keep going, right? Let's keep figuring out how we can make sure that our project does not fail. Let's get into it. The next one, bad data and bad process mapping. So if one of the main reasons why projects fail is having bad data, how do I make sure I have a good data, right? That's very, very important. And it's actually pretty simple. You need to understand what a good outcome looks like. And you have to have several examples of what that is. For example, simplest example here, you're trying to automate an email answering system. You get an email, you respond. If you don't have examples or if you don't know what a good email looks like, there's no way you're going to be able to automate something like that. If you're trying to automate creation of TV commercials, if you don't know what a good TV commercial is, you're not going to be able to create one. Same thing for proposals, same things for data entry, invoice management, images, videos, whatever. You need to understand what a good outcome looks like before you're able to create new ones with AI. If you don't have that, you're not going to be able to do it. So make sure you understand what good is. If you have many good examples of great outcomes, you're golden. If you're not, find some. <laughs> if you don't have good data, then go back to step number one and find the person accountable for the project and make sure that they know they need to find a way to get good data. People don't like labeling. People don't like giving examples. It takes forever. So we need accountability here to make sure that you're able to get the right amount of data to make your project successful. Otherwise, if you don't have good data, what's going to happen is the technical team is going to be completely lost. It's going to tell you, hey, does this look good? You're going to say, no, it sucks. They're going to say, why? Well, because I don't like it. And then it's a mess, right? If you have a clear example of what good looks like, it's very easy for the technical team to validate and measure what they're building against a golden data set. But also, you need to have good process mapping. When you don't have a good process mapping, your project is going to fail. Why? Because if you're trying to automate a process, because everything's a process, right? Everything involves steps. If you don't know how to make something happen or how something is currently done or how people solve this particular problem right now, if you don't know that, then there's no way for you to really attack it. You know, so for example, if you want to prevent churn in a business and you realize that, hey, I'm losing customers here. You need to identify where in this process, where in the customer journey your customers are leaving. So if you don't have that process mapped out, you're not going to be able to figure out this is the problem. This is the way and why my customers are leaving. It can be a friction point. It can be a bad experience. It could be just lack of follow up, right? So make sure you map your processes, both if you want to automate something, because if you want to automate, you need to follow each step in order or to really identify what the problem is. If you don't map processes, you're not going to be able to do any of these. And that's why projects that don't do that fail. Let's keep going. This next one, it's really, really easy to miss when you're looking at reasons why your project failed, but it's a constant thing we've seen and then we want to prevent every single time. And it's culture clashes and speed mismatches. Okay, so what does that mean? Culture clashes and speed mismatches, right? Your tech team might not work at the same pace as your marketing team or as your legal team or as your finance team. And if you're trying to create software products that affect the tech team, the marketing team, the finance team, or whoever team you're building this for, you're going to make have to make sure there's good communication between the owner, the tech team, and the potential clients. 
or the potential users in this case, right? Okay, so take this example. Imagine you're building a legal review system that will help the legal team identify errors or identified special clauses in contracts that come from customers. Imagine you have your tech team, imagine you have your legal team. And of course, to make this successful, they have to work together. Legal team needs to understand what do they need to do and what's helpful for them. And the tech team needs to understand how can we build it and what's important for the legal team. There needs to be very tight communication between them. Okay, what happens when you have culture clashes or speed mismatches, right? What happens is imagine your tech team is shipping out features once a week. It's putting them into production. It's shipping them out, putting them as ready in the backlog and then going to the next thing. Once a week, pushing, 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 pushing. Then imagine the legal team. It's only reviewing features only giving feedback on this once a month because they're I don't know because it's tax season and they're very very busy at this moment if this happens what's going to happen is your tech team is going to build 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 for a whole month without getting any feedback and that's the problem the moment you build without feedback then you are very likely going in the wrong direction not because you have a bad tech team but it's because the tech team will be building off assumptions instead of feedback and the tech team is not a legal team so after a month the legal team will come in and say hey what is all these things we built we don't need any of these this sucks that so many extra steps this is not good for us this sucks the tech team is going to say hey this is amazing it works perfectly look at all the pretty technical details that we use to build it and then crash right your legal team doesn't like your tech team your tech team doesn't like your legal team project fails nobody likes each other right you need to make sure that you set up good communication structures and a good cadence for review and building and if you're able to do that you're going to have a happy tech team and a happy legal team or you know whatever metaphor you want to go with so make sure you avoid cultural clashes and speed mismatches building upon the previous point of failure about tech teams and legal teams not being able to communicate correctly the next thing is actually very related to it. It's because there's not a good understanding of the underlying technology and what it can do. And if your tech team or your product owner or whoever's involved in the project is not able to communicate the tech limitations and what the tech can do to either the customers or to your internal teams, there's going to be a problem and unmet expectations. Having good understanding of what the technology can do is very important because it manages expectations and expectations is one of the most important things that you can manage in a project. If they're too high, then you can hit them. People are going to be disappointed. If they're too low, your project's not going to be greenlit. You have to manage expectations so they're realistic. You can actually hit them. And you know, bonus tip, under promise and over deliver every single time. You have no idea how many times we've seen people come in and saying, hey, I saw this cool demo of AI doing absolutely everything in the video. And it's able to just control your whole desktop and solve every problem that we have. Hey, it's marketing. People lie in marketing videos you know remember Sora when Sora came out first when OpenAI announced Sora like it was this cool Tokyo city video of this lady walking through it in the rain and it looked amazing you know and Sora didn't come out for a year and a half and then it didn't really even do that that was technically edited you need to be able to communicate or understand the limitations of technology so that, such that you can build the right thing same thing happens with scale. Same thing happens when you're building a POC. And, and this is particularly important when you're building a POC, a proof of concept, or an MVP, as I mentioned in a previous point. You're building something targeted. You're building something useful. You're not building an enterprise-ready application. You're not building something that's going to integrate as every single team and look at all the edge cases. So when you're selling this internally or implementing it internally, make sure expectations are met. Make sure you explain the scope of what you built and where we'll go in the future, but not over promise and under deliver. Do the opposite under promise. It's going to be great. Hey, look, it's solving your problem and then over deliver. It's like, hey, in the future, we can do all these other things. But at this moment, make sure you always keep expectations in check with good communication and good understanding of the tech behind your product. The next one's actually really, really, really fun. I love talking about this because nobody's thinking about this when you're building a tech product. And what is it? It's sales. Is the monetization strategy behind it. And you know, sales is what makes things happen. If you're in a startup, of course, you need to have sales even before you start building. If you have an internal tool, you know, your company, you're building this for your customers or for your internal teams, have a monetization strategy. Hey, how can I either save money from it or how can I get more money from it? That's it. That's the two things you can do. So make sure you're good at sales or make sure you get very good at monetizing this. If you don't have that, your project will fail because it won't be able to monetize. It won't be able to capture that value that we identified before. So yeah, you know, nobody likes sales, but you gotta do it, so get started. Okay, next one, which is not future-proofing your solution. 
everybody actually thinks about this a lot. You'll be surprised. Everybody's already thinking, okay, how can I prevent whatever I built to be obsolete in the next year, right? And again, you've seen it so many times. GPT-5 comes out, kills 100 startups. That's why they fail. They got replaced by a better model. They were solving a problem that was so easy to solve that just another model was able to do it better than them. There's this really famous example of Bloomberg, you know, the finance giant in, in, in New York, saying, hey, I want to build a large language model for myself. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this thing. This was before GPT-4 came out. They built their own LLM based on internal documents and finance analysis and all these different things. They spent millions of dollars on this thing. And then GPT-4 came out and it was better at finance than they were, not future-proofing. Which also, if I were able to translate this, I would say projects are not future-proof because they're trying to be something that they're not. What does this mean? Bloomberg thought they were an AI large language model company, not a financial tech company. Stick to what you do best. Unless you are open AI, anthropic, and have billions of dollars, you know, you're not going to replace these big companies that all they do all day is build large language models. You know, focus on your core use case. Focus on solving that problem that you have identified. And if you're able to do that very, very well, no matter which model, no matter, no matter what comes out later and you're able to solve it correctly, it's not going to be replaced. So in a way, you future-proof your projects by making sure you're solving your right problem here. What if I'm solving the right problem and also I'm not future proofing? Okay, this is where you go in and actually create a model agnostic architecture. And I don't want to get technical here, but the idea is don't over rely on a particular model or a particular technology if you don't have to. You know, make sure that whatever you build, then you can integrate third party solutions that come up over time. Don't become overly dependent on one particular third party library. Why? Well, because again, if GPT-6 comes out now and you're all dependent on, you know, GPT-5 and everything's hyper personalized to that, you're going to have a problem. Make sure you're always building something modularized, ready to go, especially now in the AI world. Understand that you're solving the right thing. Again, thing I say all the time. If you're solving the right thing, you're always future proofing your solution. And then also make sure you know what you are. You're not open AI, you're not anthropic, you're solving other problems for people. So make sure you solve them very, very well. And that way, you know, the next model is not just going to replace you. All right, last one. This actual one, it's not surprising. It's actually pretty straightforward, but it's very, very important. And it's one of the main reasons why AI projects fail. And it's weak KPIs. You need to understand what success looks like. Is it customer adoption? Is it revenue created? Is it time saved? Is it something else? If you're not able to articulate this from the beginning, your project is going to fail. And that's why when we work on projects, those are the first things we identify. What does success look like and how can we measure it? You know, there's this famous saying, whatever you can measure is what you can manage. Right. And that's true. You have to be very clear with everybody involved on what success looks like so that everybody's working towards that same goal. To that point, this is a huge responsibility and a huge pain point to define what that KPI is going to be. If you define the wrong ones, you're going to go in the wrong direction. Make sure you have a simple, easy to understand KPI that everybody's going towards. Otherwise, your team's going to build the wrong thing. Everybody's going the wrong way and you're going to have a failed product. OK, guys, so we've actually gone through the main reasons why AI projects fail. We built hundreds of successful products around dozens of verticals. So we know what we're talking about. If you have an idea and you want to take it from zero to one, of course, take this into account, but I have another video that's going to walk you through how to do that and make a project successful. So take a look at it. That's going to be linked somewhere in this video. Take a look at it and I'll be waiting for you on the other side.